The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Oh, we're ready. All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Sylvester. I am a principal sales consultant with Oracle um, in the MySQL practice. I've been with MySQL since 2005, though. Oh, the camera. All right. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm at Oracle, but I, I started in the right place, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about what's coming up in 5.6, a little bit what's coming up in the next release of MySQL cluster. Um, and as we go along, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask during my talk. Uh, this is just a safe harbor statement saying, if I talk about release dates and things like that, which I try not to, don't take my word for it, because it's, if it's not official, it's not official, according to Oracle. So, uh, so MySQL has been part of Oracle now for, it's a little over two years. The, the final, uh, after, uh, acquisition took place and everything, uh, finalized, I think, in January or February of, uh, of 2010. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I still get asked the question of, you know, well, what's Oracle going to do with MySQL? What is Oracle's plans with MySQL? Um, are they going to kill it? Um, are they going to just let it die on the vine? Uh, and I, I usually point out to what has happened since we've become part of Oracle. Um, since that time, we've had unarguably the best release of MySQL ever, 5.5. Uh, got rave reviews, um, lots of good things in there, lots of good things for the community. We added some things for commercial users, but, but it's just been a really good release. And Oracle's plans for MySQL are really to make MySQL better for where it's commonly used in the web market. Um, we're starting to see more and more use on the, in the Windows uh, market and Windows space. Um, you know, we've been used in, in embedded applications for a long time. We, we still see people interested in using MySQL in embedded applications. So, so the goal is to just make MySQL a better MySQL database. It's not to turn MySQL into Oracle Lite or, you know, mini Oracle. Um, and if you see what Oracle's done, if you see the, the, um, the, the support staff we've added, the engineering staff we've added, um, yeah, we've added in sales and, and marketing and other places too, but in those key areas where we're doing product development and where we're doing product support, we are adding and we continue to add folks to, to build out the product, to support the product. Um, it's interesting because e even on our support aspect, we still have a, a core group of support engineers that have gone through the, two, the same two acquisitions that a lot of my colleagues and I have gone through, you know, going through being purchased by Sun and then a year and a half later being purchased by Oracle. So, uh, so you, you know, we're, we're continuing to build those, those key core areas out. We're continuing to, to add to the, to the staff to, to support the MySQL database. Um, we still have and we still offer the GPL uh, community release. It's, you know, it, it's got more features that are being added even in 5.6. So as we talk about 5.6, everything that I'm going to talk about is things that are going into the community release, into the, uh, the GPL release of the product. Um, currently, I, I, the other question I get asked frequently is, well, what's the difference between commercial MySQL, the commercial licensed MySQL database, and the community release of MySQL. And at the code level, they're virtually identical. Um, there are a few libraries that are included in the community release that we cannot include in the commercial release because they are GPL libraries, and they're not owned by Oracle. Um, those differences are actually going <laughs> to 5.6 is we're not using those libraries, we're using other libraries. But so in 5.6, the, the code will be the same. What's in community and what's in commercial, as far as the database goes, will be the same. Um, there are some frameworks that are in the, in the source code and those for authentication and some other things 
that we are writing plugins to basically, or ex we call them extensions, but they're basically plugins to the database, but those same frameworks can be used by the community and they're actually, there are some plugins from the community that make use of those uh, frameworks. So if, if you look at the, the releases that we've had, I mean, there's been um, a plethora of releases uh, since, since, you know, calendar year 2010. Um, the, the core server, the MySQL server, but the supporting tools around it, like Workbench. Uh, we've had multiple releases of MySQL Workbench. So by the way, do you guys, I mean, this is probably a heavy Linux crowd, so I don't expect to see too many, but Workbench, anybody using Workbench for MySQL? How many people are running MySQL today? Okay, so a good crowd. So uh, any, do you guys know what Workbench is? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so a few. So um, it's a graphical tool for working with MySQL, for submitting queries, for doing administration. Um, it's got a graphical data modeler. Uh, it, it's a great way to reverse engineer a database. If you get a new database and want to do reverse engineering um, to get the data model, it's, it's a great tool to use for that. Uh, we're adding a migration tool. So we used to have a GUI migration tool for Windows way back when. Um, we're adding that functionality into Workbench. So. Um, it, it's got its use cases. I see if, I'm, if it's a Windows crowd, you see a lot more people, if they're using MySQL, they're also using Workbench uh, because of the graphical nature of it. Um, does, it run, does, does Workbench run on Linux too? It does. It does. It's available for Linux. Uh, Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Is it a paid program? So the question was, is Workbench a paid program? There's actually two versions. There's a community version, GPL version, and there is a, it's called the standard edition, a commercial version that adds a few extra like reporting tools for databases and some um, verification functionality and some stuff like that. But for the most part, the product is a GPL product, a free product. Uh, so if you look, some of the other things that are on this list are not available as a GA product yet. And this, that's what we call the development milestone releases. So what I'll be talking about a lot in this session is about the 5.6 development milestone release of the MySQL server. So just a, a quick recap, I won't spend too much time. So uh, those folks running MySQL, 5.5 users? A, a, a few, mostly 5.1, 5.0, any 4.1, 4.0? Okay, we, in the embedded crowd, embedded audience, would, there's still a lot of 4.0 and 4.1 usage out there. Um, so so 5.5 was uh, the latest GA release. It was released, uh, what was it, I guess, about two years ago. Um, two and a half years ago, maybe? I don't know. I, it all kind of blends together after a while. Um, but there's, there was, so there's been some major improvements in 5.5. One of the biggest changes you might see from just a usage standpoint is that NODB is now the default storage engine in the 5.5 release. Um, it's, it's still changeable at the configuration level, but if you don't change anything on a default install, you will be using NODB when you create tables. Uh, a lot, a lot of changes in NODB and a lot of changes in the server, it, kind of in the low level. Um, most of those changes were for performance to take advantage of modern hardware, multi-threaded systems, faster disks. Um, but there's been some other changes in other areas, like in replication, uh, the addition of adding a semi-synchronous option to replication, and a replication heartbeat so that you get a better feel, you, you get a much better uh, feel of how far behind your slaves are and, and what the latency is writing out to the slaves. If you use store procedures, there's been some important changes in 5.5 for store procedures and that you can actually signal out of store procedures. So I don't know if there's any store procedure users here, but uh, 5.5 offers a way to actually exit out of a store procedure in a clean way instead of the way you have to do it today in 5.1. Um, and partitioning. So if anybody's using partitioning, uh, the, the, the real uh, addition in 5.5 is that the partitioning can be done now on a character field or on a date time without having con to convert it to an integer. If you're using 5.1 partitioning, that's the caveat, is that you have to convert it to an integer. So, uh, like I said, lots of changes, lots of good changes in the 5.5 release. 
Um, a, real quick about enterprise, so we do offer support for MySQL, uh, which is basically taking the GPL server, like I said, this from a source standpoint, they're virtually identical, and adding either tools or you know, just access to 24 by seven support engineers around the world, um, and other things uh, from product certifications for Oracle. So I'm gonna ask the question, because but I don't expect a real rousing answer. Any Oracle users here? Oh, I have one. So so one thing that we if if they there's a lot of Oracle use and a lot of MySQL use in the shop, um, chances are they're using Oracle tools for doing management, either Enterprise Manager or some other Oracle tools for, for managing managing their infrastructure, Oracle infrastructure. And where it makes sense, MySQL is being added into those tools. Um, there's some certifications we can go in later if you're interested, but just to let you know um, that, yeah, if, if it makes sense, we're being added into those tools. So I talked about the, the code differences or minor, that they're basically the same code. From a, for If you do have a support subscription with MySQL, there are some extensions that we make available for authentication and security. Um, there are extensions for doing thread pooling. Uh, for, for increasing the scalability. And other things are just certifications and some extra options that are available for uh, taking advantage of Oracle clustering or Windows clustering for those customers. So I, I, I point this out because I actually walked into an account, they showed me this graph, and it was the shortest sales meeting I've ever been in. Um, they were, they were Long-time MySQL user, they were using 5.1. They hosted, I don't know, something like 60 to 70 websites on a single instance. And they saw this, basically they saw this problem. At about five to 600 concurrent connections to the database, their throughput just dropped and just went to hell. Um, so they saw this, they said, how do we get this? We said, well, that's actually you know, part of a subscription to get the thread pooling. Um, so this is what thread pooling can do for you. Uh, the problem with MySQL in the default connection model is that every session gets a thread. That thread is basically a little memory structure that the MySQL server has to track and manage and, and keep, keep up with. Um, and that's for the life of the session, whether that session's sitting there doing nothing, whether the person went to lunch and left it open, whatever, you know, it, even if it's idle, it still has to manage it. So thread pooling basically multiplexes connections into a number of thread groups. So it has a much better way of handling large uh, user communities, concurrent connections, and it has better ways to manage um, thread priority and session priority, and there's some, some tweaking you can do there to, to better manage your database from a connection standpoint. So, I'm gonna talk about what's in 5.6. So what are we working on for the next GA release? Um, a ton of stuff. Um, we, we did a lot of work in 5.5, and again, a quick, quick history lesson. Oracle has been uh, the owner of the NODB database and the small company that developed it since 2005. So they bought this little company called InnoBase in 2005. Um, so they've actually been the stewards of the InnoDB storage engine for, what, seven years now, or going on seven years. In that time, they've improved it, they have, you know, um, made it a better transactional engine, they've fixed, whenever bugs came up, they were timely fixes, I mean, they've just done really well by the InnoDB storage engine. But it was always a separate development team, it was always a separate code base, in effect, than, the, than the, the rest of the MySQL server. So now, you know, since these teams are now working together and uh, being able to share knowledge at a deeper level and being able to share engineering at a deeper level, that's where 5.5 came about and that's, we're starting to see that kind of accelerate with 5.6, where they're able to go in there and look at some of the low level internal structures of MySQL and, and remove some bottlenecks that are there, remove long standing bugs that were there um, to just really improve the scalability of the server and the performance of the server. Uh, we'll, we'll go into each of these in a little more detail, but 
if you look at, at what 5.6 is working on, um, the optimizers being improved, uh, the performance schema, uh, for anyone who knows what that is, the performance schema is basically low level metrics of what's going on at the, at the server level. Um, today in 5.5, the performance schema is, it's really low level, it's like support engineer level where they wanna go look and see what mutex locks are there, how many spin locks there are. I mean, if you look at the stuff, it's like, well, a normal, I'm not a normal DBA because I don't do it for a living, but I would think a normal DBA is kind of like really low level, not what you'd want to use. In 5.6, there's, I would say, DBA level statistics that are being going to start surfacing. Um, and we'll talk about what, what those are. Uh, replication, this is, this release is going to have more replication changes than I think every other release culminated in the past. Um, since replication was introduced. So if you're a replication user, you're gonna wanna know it's in 5.6 and you're probably gonna want to use it. Um, anybody read up on 5.6, seen anything on 5.6 yet? It's besides Max? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so, uh, so if you're interested, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of, we're, we're starting to educate folks through webcasts. Um, we had an innovation day a few, a few days ago where the engineers talked about some of this stuff. But, uh, but from a replication standpoint, this is going to be a huge, huge release. And the last thing is that we're constantly, currently constantly, um, being either compared or being asked about NoSQL or being saying, well, we're not using MySQL because we're using Mongo or we're using um, Hadoop or Cassandra or some other NoSQL database for scalability reasons or for whatever reasons. Um, or for, for the fact that you know, they, they like, they like the, the no schema kind of uh, option. Well, I'll talk about what we're doing from a no SQL standpoint to support those types of use cases. Now, talking about the way we do releases nowadays, um, our goal, MySQL's goal and Oracle's goal is to basically come out with a a new, you can think of them as beta releases, the, the DMR, the development milestone releases, every three to six months. I, I think we've, we've kind of stayed along that track. Um, and what gets put in those development milestone releases are new features that have been QA to some point where we feel comfortable of getting it into users' hands so that they can start testing out new features. Um, so the goal is that they're close to release quality uh, the feature has been tested enough that we feel comfortable putting it into a development milestone release. The latest one for 5.6 was in April, right, right around the time of the Procona Live conference. Um, we released a new version of 5.6. And if we're working on features that are even further out there, more experimental, they'll show up on a, a website called labs.mysql.com. So we have a labs website now that if you want to look at the NoSQL or the Memcache integration with 5.6 and NoDB, that's actually a labs release. So you can download that release and, and start testing it out. So from an optimizer standpoint, um, subquery optimizations, that's always been kind of the bane of MySQL's um, SQL parser and SQL processing is that subquery performance is not good. <laughs> The optimizer basically doesn't optimize it in any way. Um, but in 5.6, there are some optimizations, particularly for in clauses, uh, for, for doing subqueries along those, those ranges. Um, there are uh, optimizations for uh, doing limit uh, queries, and particularly where file sorts are involved. So um, what's really, again, if you look at where our, our market is in the web space and those use cases, lots of people do frequent queries where they limit the result set coming back to you know, a few rows. Um, and the old optimizer, it basically has to run the query, even if you, especially if you do a limit where you want to go, let's say 10,000 rows into a table and grab the next 10. Uh, we basically have to run that whole query, that whole result set, return it back to the server and then it picks off the last 10 that it needs or whatever 10 it needs. So there's been some optimizations in 5.6 where it, it basically reads to the point it needs to, grabs that little subset and just returns that little subset back. 
So there's some, there's some interactions with the way we have storage engines and the way the server works where it, it's kind of decoupled and that decoupling causes performance bottlenecks. So we're trying to, to push things down more into the engine so that it does more work and gives you small results so it's back through this, this handler interface that we have. Um, it's kind of along the lines, that's, that's where index condition push down comes about too. Where if we can take part of the where clause or part of the, the SQL processing and push it lower level into the engine and let it do more of the work, um, then we can get some very, very drastic performance time improvements. Um, batch key access, multi-range reads. This is primarily for disk operations. If you have to go to disk, uh, we're trying to optimize how you read data off the disk. Um, and then, again, postponing um, materialization of views and subviews from a from clause, particularly like when you're doing explains and things like that. Um, we're optimizing those things. From a usability standpoint, one of the more frequent requests we get is being able to explain updates, inserts, and other DML operations instead of just explaining select statements. It's finally going to be in 5.6 where you'll be able to explain other SQL statements. Uh, the other thing being added is um, having the explain output come out in JSON format. So we, it's it's a more usable format for bringing into other tools. We put a little more information into there, um, so you just get a better explain format coming back, and it allows you to do things. It allows you to do build like explain trees much easier and things like that uh, when you get it back, in, and we'll take advantage of that too. Uh, other things like persistent optimizer statistics and optimizer traces, um, or kind of some usability and some performance tracking things. So index condition push down, again, if, if, the, uh, if the query is such that we can push uh, part of the where clause down to the storage engine and let it basically reduce the subset of rows coming back, um, you can see just the, the uh, performance improvement from running without it, even if you have a decent sized buffer pool, uh, you know, there's still 1.4 seconds, we're down to 90 milliseconds. And again, it's just improving the, the interaction between basically the, 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 the server part of it and the storage engine part of it and being able to push that into the storage engine. Um, this doesn't have to be, it's not an NODB necessarily optimization. It can work with any storage engine. So even if you're using like NDB, we can still take advantage of index condition push down by pushing it down to the NDB storage engine. Uh, again, batch key access and multi-range reads are uh, primarily an operation op optimization for disk reads and disk uh, access to data. Um, if your data is in the buffer cache, it doesn't really give you much better performance. But uh, if, you're, if you need to go to disk, um, batch key access, multi-range read basically says, it tries to optimize disk reads by sorting on the primary key. And this is where it does, for NODB, it does make a difference. Since NODB is clustered on the primary key, that means the table sorted on the primary key. Um, and especially if you're using secondary indexes, the way NODB works with secondary indexes is it has to go to secondary index to find the primary key, and then it does a lookup into the primary key into the table to get the row. Um, Multi-range reads basically let it optimize that, op that operation by batching the keys, reading through the secondary index, getting a range of keys, sorting them, and then having it go to the disk and basically do a sequential read on disk. So it, again, speeds up disk operations. Um, again, for, for, uh, for primarily for explains, um, or other queries, we, we try to not materialize every part of, especially subqueries, every part of the query when the, when the query gets run. So today there's really no optimization. Even if you do explain, you have a subquery and an explain, it'll have to run that, run that query in effect before it gives you the explain output back. Um, we've made some tweaks, of course, so that it doesn't have to actually run the subquery, doesn't have to actually run the query to be able to give you what the explain output would be. 
And for, other, for certain queries, it, it helps also. Um, again, anybody using MySQL waiting for this kind of stuff or? No? Not really? You're not one of the users? So what it says it's a big user request, long-standing user request. Of course, that could mean that people. Huh? I'm not waiting, but it's interesting. Right, right. So long-standing could mean it was put in three, you know, five years ago and people forgot about it. And since MySQL didn't do it, <laughs> no use beating yourself up on it, right? Um, optimizer traces, primarily this is for, I, I, primarily for support folks, primarily for um, uh, maybe developers that want a, a much better idea of what the server's actually doing or what the optimizer considered to run a query. So with explain, you basically get back what the optimizer chose and the path it's going to do to run the query. With optimizer traces, well, you can look into see, well, what did the optimizer consider? What were the optimizer's choices for making this final decision? Um, so it could be a tuning thing, it could be a tweaking thing, like I say, it could be for support to go in and say, we're seeing this a lot in customer implementations and customer queries, maybe we should modify or you know, enhance the optimizer to handle these kinds of cases better. Just gives us a better view into what's happening at the server level. I don't know how far I can walk out before the camera does doesn't see me anymore, but not that it needs to see me all the time. Um, so again, performance schema is a, I, I don't want to say it's virtual tables, but it's something like virtual tables that kind of map onto memory structures that the server has. And we're starting to expose more of those memory structures and putting you know, virtual tables on top of those memory structures and count on top of those counters so that they start to become useful to DBAs. And like I said, in 5.5, it's really low-level information. It's about mutex locks. It's about spin locks. It's about things that the server's doing deep in, in the bowels of the server. In 5.6, we're starting to expose it more so that you can answer questions that you might have as a DBA as a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, so what are my most resource-intensive queries? Who's running them? Um, what queries is this user running during this time frame? Uh, you know, uh, how many queries or how many users are idle during the day or during a certain time frame? So there's a lot of things that you can't answer with MySQL without building your own tools to parse logs or whatever that we're trying to expose in the performance schema so that you can answer them just through simple SQL queries against uh, a schema. Um, the, the information it gathers can be detailed but we do try to roll them up, and there's, I think I, and I just saw this from the developer for Innovation Day, I think there's around 40 to 50 summary tables that we create to summarize a lot of this detailed information um, so that you don't have to do the summaries and so that we can keep information longer, right? Because, again, we've got to store it someplace. Um, so we don't want to necessarily store the, the low-level detailed information for long periods of time, but we can store summaries um, reasonably and comfortably. And this is kind of the hierarchy of how the performance scheme and the event hierarchy that it uses. So at the very low level, you get things like you know, sync locks and IO locks and wait times, um, where and, and you can answer questions basically at all of these levels except for transactions currently. So we're working on adding transactional support to this. Uh, but you can start looking at the stages of a SQL query, what stages, uh, what kind of timing for each stages. Look at the statement, of course, and then at a session level. So this just kind of explains the hierarchy of, of how we're gathering information. So other enhancements. Um, for NODB, like I said, there's, there's a bunch. Uh, there's, again, some, some kind of low-level things like in, improving the LRU flushing, um, improving the, uh, the flushing through p the purge thread, so now there's multiple purge threads in 5.6, which will improve uh, flushing of old data out to disk. When NODB needs more buffer, more free buffers, it's got to flush them out somehow. We're improving that. Um, 
Big things, though, are to be able to dump and restore the buffer pool. So this is something that, uh, that allows you to take what's in the buffer pool and basically copy it out to disk so that when you restart the server, you can reload the buffer pool and you start with a, a hot cache in your server without having to warm it up. Uh, other usability things is full text search. Anybody use full text search in my ISAM? No, all right, so uh, maybe you don't care. Uh, so <laughs> full text search is moving into NODB. Um, variable page sizes. So this is uh, for SSD, for if you're using SSD disks or interested in using SSD disks. Uh, NODB today has a 16K buffer, uh, a 16K page size, which isn't really optimal for SSDs. So having variable page sizes will let you define a page size for NODB, and that will let you take much better advantage of SSDs um, and larger indexes. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, that's uh, interesting. So any questions on NODB? All right, so replication. Anybody using replication? Come on, nobody, besides Max. Max, you don't count. <laughs> you guys, so you're running MySQL and nobody uses replication? Oh, interesting, huh? No? All right, I, usually I see at least someone using replication. So um, does everybody know what replication is? Okay, so uh, like I said, there's been, there's, there's a, a, a large number of changes for replication. Some of the big things that people have been waiting for for a long time are time-delayed replication. So now you can basically have a master with multiple slaves, and you can set up one or more of your slaves to be so many seconds or so many minutes behind the master. So that if you have an oops moment on the master and think, oops, somebody dropped the table, you, it doesn't automatically get propagated to the slave. Um, if it's five minutes behind, then you have time to go in there and, and stop it and, and fix the problem before it becomes a real big problem. Um, global transaction IDs are probably the big, single biggest thing in replication, though. And the reason global transaction IDs are important is because it, number one, makes the replication topology much easier to manage, and it makes the failover to, from a master to a slave much easier to manage and to do and to track. Um, today, there's no way to, to know without running some checksums or something against tables to know which one of your slaves, if you have multiple slaves, are the best one to fail over to. With global transaction IDs, it's really easy because every transaction gets a unique ID associated with it. That transaction ID flows through the replication topology and gets tracked through the replication topology so that you know which slave you can go to because we will report which ones have been uh, applied to the slaves. It's better than that. It's, well, it's, so Chuck Bell is one of the primary authors of all this um, and is writing utilities to take advantage of it. So yes, Chuck. <laughs> Right. Um, and it gets updates from all the other slaves if need be, right? Yeah, so I, I'm talking while the author of all this stuff is sitting back there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, the other, the other, one of the other big changes is multi-threaded slaves. So again, today in replication, the slave process is a single-threaded process. Um, the implication of being single-threaded is that it can lag pretty far behind the master if there's a heavy write load. Because the master is not single-threaded, the master is a multi-threaded engine, a multi-threaded process, so it can handle much larger transaction volumes, whereas the thread right now does, has to do things in a single-threaded manner. Um, multi-threaded slaves allow you to, to somewhat, it's kind of like baby steps into to multi-threading, in that it will apply things by database par in parallel. So you have to have, you know, take advantage of multiple schemas and multiple databases. Um, other big things like crash slaves, crash safe slaves. Um, 
where primarily we're keeping things in files today. We're moving those, that, that information, like the, the master information and the relay log information. We're moving that into InnoDB tables so that it now gets transactionalized, it gets synced up with the server, um, and it makes recovering much, much cleaner. And some other big things, again, the author is back there, are some utilities that we've written to help with either manual failover to a slave or automatic failover. So today, if you're running replication and you want to set up time, some type of automatic failover thing, you have to go outside MySQL proper and get some utilities to help with that, um, to script that out. So again, this is the kind of a graphical depiction of global transaction IDs. Um, you can see that you know, this transaction has been propagated to all the slaves, so everything is cool and up to date. But uh, yeah, so without beating a dead horse, it's, it's much easier to track and to, to manage slaves and to be able to know which slave to fail over to and to manage the failover process. And the utilities are, so there's, there's a couple that I'll talk about, um, but the MySQL Workbench product actually ships with a fair number, I don't know, 15, 20 today, utilities that are written in Python um, that do various things that will help you set up replication, they'll help you set up a slave, they'll help you copy databases, uh, those types of things. But the two I'll talk about are specifically geared towards working with replication and working with global transaction IDs to help with either, like I said, manually fail over, failing over to a slave so, that, so you can do some work on the master, um, or automatically having, having it automatically fail over in, in the case of a, a glitch or some kind of problem with the slave. Um, they're, like I said, they're delivered with Workbench, but they're also available through a Git repository, right? Um, so you can get them outside without getting Workbench. So it's kind of the, the, the workflow and kind of the way you would use them is, you know, you can, you can run some commands to verify the, the replication topology, to verify how things are running. Uh, you can initiate replication to a new slave. And, and I've done a little bit of testing with this. And what's, if you've used replication before, what's really cool is that when you set up a new slave, you don't have to tell it, well, start with this binary log in this, in this position. When you set up a new slave, you just basically set up a new slave, point it to the master, and it'll get all the transactions it needs to based on that global transaction ID. So it makes setting up new slaves really, really easy. Um, you can display what the topology looks like. You can display the status. And again, you can help fail over or administer servers. So the replication failover utility. Um, yeah, so again, automatically fails over. Uh, it, it, it will decide based on its uh, parameters, how you have it configured, which slave to use. It will decide based on the global transaction ID, which one to use. Um, it will automatically nominate the, the most up-to-date slave to be failed over to. This one, this is the one that can be used with 5.5, right? So it's, the switchover can be used with 5.5. So this you can actually take advantage of with current releases of MySQL. Um, because it doesn't necessarily rely on the global transaction ID to do things. So this is the administration utility. And these are command line, by the way, at, at, at present. I don't know if there's plans to make them part of the GUI workbench, but for the command line folks, these are all command line utilities. So other enhancements. So maybe, maybe you'll see something in this list you like. Um, the first one, fractional precision in time in time date, date time. It's been a long time request. Many people have been waiting for it. Uh, partition tables, so anybody using partitioning? Wow, none. Ronald, Ronald and Max. I told Max he couldn't raise his hand anymore. Um, so uh, partitioning is being improved from a usability standpoint and, and I guess from an administration standpoint, will allow you to import uh, a partition into an existing table or export a partition out of an existing table. 
So if you're setting up partitioning and you'd like to maybe archive older partitions, you don't want to keep them part of the, the base table anymore, this is a very easy way to take older partitions, move them to their own tables, and either you know, really archive them off or move them to a different storage engine, um, whatever you need to do. And if anybody's using GIS and still uses my ISAM for doing GIS operations, um, there's been some improvements for, um, from a precision GIS standpoint. Uh, so again, it's available now. You can go to the dev site and download it and test it out. So there's this other website I talked about, the lab. So if you're really looking at more, I guess, cutting edge stuff and, and are looking for more experimental stuff about MySQL and are interested, um, a couple of things out there now is, again, for replication, and knowing I'm talking to a crowd that doesn't seem to be running replication, but there's some, uh, some good things coming besides what I've already talked about. Uh, the bin log API is basically a way for you to access the binary log and access the data that's in the binary log through a, a proper API um, so that if you're using MySQL in kind of like a heterogeneous database fashion and you want to be able to pull transactions out and move them to another, to another database or something like that, uh, the bin log API could play a pivotal role by letting you easily get to the transactional data for MySQL. Uh, bin log group, group commit is an optimization to basically uh, uh, improve the writing out to the binary log so that it doesn't write after every transaction. You can batch things up and write in, in a batch. Anybody using memcache? No? All right. Soon. Soon. So, I got a soon there. That's good. Um, so, uh, a lot of our customers are, again, running big websites. Big websites, a lot of them use Memcache to improve read operations. Uh, Memcache is a way to cache any object, whether it's a database row, whether it's an image, whatever you want to cache, into a distributed object cache. It's open source, um, again, heavily used. Some customers run hundreds of Memcache servers. Um, we are providing an API that will let you still use the Memcache API, but then work directly with some of our storage engines, like NODB and Cluster. So today, for NDB, we actually have the API available in 7.2 so that you can use the Memcache protocols. And instead of using Memcache to cache things, you can actually cache it in Cluster. Uh, cluster, by default, is a read resident database. Um, so it's already cached in memory. It's a way to not double cache things. Um, this is one of the big things that we're, we're, we're hoping makes the 5.6 release. Again, that whole thing of don't believe my lies at the beginning. Um, but online operations, uh, being able to add columns, being able to add and drop indexes for NODB from an operational standpoint is a, is a huge thing. And the uh, SSD uh, optimizations, which Again, kind of takes, takes use of the uh, multiple page sizes available. Um, again, key value access for NODB, for those folks that are thinking about Memcache or using Memcache and, and hear about all this NoSQL stuff, this is actually going to be a NoSQL access into NODB data. So our priorities. Oracle's priorities for MySQL, again, is to make MySQL a better MySQL database. But our priorities as MySQL is to, um, to, to help people as they're deploying things into the cloud. So we have a lot of people that run an Amazon EC2. We have a lot of people that want to take advantage of either Amazon RDS or some other cloud service offering where they don't want to manage the instances. They'll just push them over and let, let some other service manage their database instances. Um, so multi-tenancy starts to become a, a, a role here. Um, there's some other optimizations we can do for uh, either helping people um, deploy into the cloud or helping them manage their instances in the cloud, their databases in the cloud. Um, other things are high availability. Right now, our replication is single way. It's master multiple slaves. A lot of people want to go the other way. Multiple sources, one target. Um, Another thing we'd like to do is be able to add that. 
Um, from a security standpoint, hopefully we'll get roles in there sometime. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what role, database roles are. Um, it's just a much easier way to manage large groups of users. So if you have a large user population, you can usually break them down into some type of roles so that you can start defining things, grants and privileges by role. Uh, and, and ultimately, this, this last line is kind of where we like to take the server from an architecture standpoint. Um, make it just a core database server and make everything else, all the other services, replication, authentication, scalability, whatever you want to add, a module in that server. The benefit for you would be that you could run asynchronous replication, but maybe we'll have a synchronous model later on for NODB, being able to do synchronous replication. Um, with, with this kind of architecture, it would be a lot easier. I'm going to ask the question, but I already know the answer. Anybody running cluster, NDB, besides Max? <laughs> so NDB is network database. It is a distributed shared nothing database storage engine for MySQL that uses the MySQL server as one of the entry points to that data. Um, it stores data in a data tier. You can scale that data tier independently of your access tier. One of the things in, in ODB can, I mean, NDB, sorry, NDB does not support today is foreign keys. So we just announced, and this was just announced this week, so I can put it up on slides and start talking about it, is foreign key support. So this is in one of the labs releases that I talked about, so this is an experimental thing, but foreign keys for, for NDB. And, and I'm excited because I get asked the question fairly often with people wanting to, to use NDB and wanting to move particularly off of NODB or thinking about moving NODB databases over to NDB. And this is the one thing that says, stop, I can't do it. So I like it. Um, other things that are coming today in cluster with NDB, we have this memcache uh, integration that I talked about. So you can use memcache protocols and memcache APIs to access NDB data and to use NDB as your caching tier. Um, where adding, hoping to add more what we call NoSQL APIs. So the first one that we're working on is a Java, server-side JavaScript API uh, so that you can use server-side you know, JavaScript to access NDB without going through a MySQL server. So the whole key is not, have, not necessarily having to go through a server, doing the SQL parsing and all that other stuff. Um, we, we have people that want to run cluster, want to run NDB, and are running cluster in, again, in Amazon services or some other cloud services. And we're hoping to add better support, better management of cluster and take advantage of, of that kind of industry movement where people seem to be moving a lot of their services into the cloud. Um, and we always want to take advantage of the latest server releases. So as 5.6 matures, as it goes GA, the goal is to get 5.6 part of the NDB, if, if nobody knows, is, a sep is basically a separate product for MySQL. It's, it's delivered as a separate binary package, a separate tar package, so it's a separate product for all practical purposes. Um, for those going to OS OSCON and want to learn more, some of the developers uh, will be giving a tutorial on the, the NoSQL stuff. So if you're interested, um, just be aware that that is happening. So for, for Ongoing cluster optimizations, again, cloud virtualized deployments. Uh, we support virtualization in the latest release of cluster, um, but that's, a, again, a long-term movement. A lot of people are moving that way. So there's some other things we can do um, to, to help in that environment that we'd like to add. Um, again, enhanced API support, richer SQL functionality, so it gets more on par with um, within ODB and, and let you use make the choice a little easier. And a big thing is uh, simplifying the configuration of cluster and simplifying the, the setup of cluster. So it's kind of, there's, there's some tools out there. There's some really good ones. There's a really good one from uh, an ex MySQL employee that's still heavily involved with cluster, one of the original engineers. Um, there's another group that I know is running, that's writing some, some configuration tools. We'd also like to write some configuration tools to make it easier to manage cluster and to set up cluster. 
so again, development priorities from a server standpoint, uh, for enterprise authentication, help with authentication, more product certifications for those Oracle shops that are, that are running both databases. Uh, you know, being formally supported by Oracle's Clusterware product, which is just another clustering uh, software suite. Uh, Enterprise Monitor. So Enterprise Monitor is one of these tools or utilities that if you have support with MySQL, you have access to. Um, it allows you to monitor hundreds of MySQL servers throughout your deployment, throughout your enterprise, or throughout your, your company. Um, we'd like to turn Enterprise Monitor into an Enterprise Manager. So add management capabilities, which is start and stop servers, start and stop a group of servers, um, easily set up replication, basically do push button replication, saying I want to start a new replication server, just do what it needs to do. Um, take advantage of and add a calendaring and a, a backup scheduling functionality. So we can use our, the enterprise backup tool we have available and let you schedule backups and things of those sorts. Uh, so enterprise backup, again, this is for those that have been in the circles for a long time, this used to be a tool from InnoBase called IB Backup. Uh, it was InnoDB Hot Backup, it was another team. Well, IB Backup, I guess, is the actual utility rant. InnoDB Hot Backup was the name of the product. Um, that's where enterprise backup's heritage is. So it's a binary backup of InnoDB tables. It's not a logical backup like through MySQL dump. Much faster, much cleaner, doesn't destroy your buffer cache. Um, let you back up larger instances, let you do quicker restores. There's a lot of advantages with it. And Workbench for a non GUI crowd. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Again, this is Oracle certifications. It's more along the lines of people that are running decent sized Oracle implementations and want to take advantage of MySQL, just kind of the integrations we're going through. So I think I finished early, right? No? Ronald, Ronald's shaking his head. <laughs> I finished kind of early, Ronald. <laughs> Questions? Timely. Good. <laughs> Are there any particular advantages to Workbench over, say, PHP MyAdmin? So his question was, were there, are there any particular advantages to Workbench over PHP MyAdmin? Um, other than that, well, it's a standalone tool. Uh, I think. I don't know a lot about PHP admin, so if someone knows both tools better, they'd probably give a better answer than I would. Or oh, Ronald. Yeah, yeah, modeling, modeling. Yeah. That, yeah, it's a standalone tool, that's one thing. The modeler's pretty good, and, and me not being a day-to-day -day DBA, I like that I can issue grants and, and set up user privileges graphically <laughs> instead of remembering the grant syntax. Yes? How, how are they, are, the slides, are, we, are they gonna put them up on a server or make them available to participants? Yeah, well, I can, yeah, we'll. I have a, give me a card, I'll give you a card, just email me. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones 
that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in DigiM's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it 
uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloud Stack Management Server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloud Stack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.